doing? So I haven't done a video in a while. So I've been doing some research on some stuff. So this is going to be about sorries and bogeys. So the sorry being the curve of the sword on a katana or a tachi because Tachi's had more of a story than it, most. So, it's about stories and bohis. So, there's different types of stories on Japanese swords. Like everything, they have a name for it. So, one of the most typical, let me grab my notes here is Suki Zori. Suki Zori is the curve is more to the top of the blade. Okay. Not so much in the middle of the blade. Which um, was normally reserved for infantry people. Okay. And then um, having the curve more actually to, to the top. Right up here. Probably would make it more front heavy instead of more back to the handle. Now, a knock, Nakazori, which, um, and I don't, a Nakazori is more the curve would be more in the center of the blade, okay? Which, um, kind of you could say Uchi Katana, that's how it is. The curve is more in the center of the blade of it. And then we have the uh, Koshi Zori. Okay, the Koshi Zori is more reserved for Tachi. Okay. So, because the curvature comes more to this way. Hang on a sec. Yeah, that was correct. The curve is more found in the handle. That's why the handle is, um, goes with the curve. I mean, it looks like it's more in the blade, but it's more if you actually look at it. If we close this up, put it in here, you see the handle goes that away. And some of them, the handle really goes that way. So, Akasha Zori is only found in Tachis. So, in the most typical we see nowadays, is the Suki, no, excuse me, the Nara Zori, which is the typical Ushi Katana. So the blade, this, the curve is more in the center. So it creates more of a balanced blade for you, and the front isn't as heavy. So it's a little insight. Um, take a look at your swords, see how. Um, the blade geometry is. Like I said, the Kusha, I believe is how it's pronounced. Um, it's not done too often anymore where the curve is more um, at the end of the blade. I really don't have anything like that. Let's see. <clears throat> Like that one, it's a little bit straighter. It's not as curved. So, but you can see the curve is more in line with here than up here. This is more straight. So the curve is in, more in the center. So those are actually the three types of curves to a Japanese sword. So we have, have to have my notes because these names uh, are really different. So you have the Koshi 
Zori. And then you have the Suki Zori. And then you have the Naka Zori. So, and it's the Shushi Zori that is the curve is more in um, the blade end, the very end of it. So it would literally, what it's going to look like is... The blade would be mainly straight until it got right about center, right about in here. And then that curve, that curve would start off and go that away. Which you don't really see anymore. It's normally the Naga Zori, where the curve is in the center. And the reason why they did this is because of balance. It gives the sword more balance put the curve more to the center especially if this curve is coming down to the handle a little bit because you can see it goes straight and then starts curving right in here and then it goes kind of straight it's not totally straight but it kind of the curve is less so now the nice thing about um, putting a curve to it is it some people says say the curve in the blade doesn't help you that much with the cut I kind of disagree with that because if you take a straight edge sword and you take any type of sword that has a curvature to it and you cut with them you will feel the difference in the cut for sure because when we cut like so we're creating an arch okay naturally we're creating an arch so if you have a straight object and you're creating a arch motion you're going to have a little bit more resistance in your cut because it's swooping but if you have something that is going in the direction of that motion it's going to be less resistant not to mention the way it's you know the sword is designed for cutting power so it's like this my tachi okay this tachi cuts really good in my opinion i mean it just blows right through a target and that's because you're creating that arch motion The other point of the arch is it actually, has, ugh, actually adds strength. Because anything that has an arch to it, you, you're going to have a hard time collapsing it. Now, obviously, if you go from the underside, it's going to break. It's like if you take the St. Louis arch, for instance. If you put something extremely heavy on the very top of it, it's going to hold it up. It's not going to collapse. But if you hit the bottom of it, the underside of the arch, it's going to collapse, okay? Because that's the weakest point, is underneath it. This, the front of it, is the strongest point of it. It's just physics. That's why they use arches and bridges and everything else, because the top of the arch is the strongest point. The underside is the weakest. So that's why swords break. If you hit it good enough on the backside, it breaks because that's the weakest point. All right, now granted, having a sword like this has advantages, has disadvantages, okay? The one great advantage to having a curved sword is the cutting ability. Not only cutting ability, but if you have a shield, the sword can get around the shield because it has that curve. The more the curve, the more you can reach around a corner, which is an advantage. Disadvantage is, a lot of times, when you have a sword curved like this that much, you need more material to make it because when they get done making it and they put the cor uh, curvature in it, the sword shrinks, okay? I know that sounds weird, but the sword shrinks down. Like, let's take, 
I forget the measurement of the length of this. I believe it's 27 and a half is the length. Let's take this sword right here. I know that for a fact that this sword is 27 and a half inches long. Okay, the blade. So, it's got about a 5 eighths, almost close to a 3 quarter curvature to it. So you take that decimal equivalent, let's say the decimal equivalent of 5 eighths, you add that length, you add that to the length of your blade. Okay. So now it's over 28 inches long. So, and I know that sounds weird, but it's true. Um, another example of a sword is this one. Right here. So this has got about a three-quarter. Sorry, not much. So add that to it. This is also about 27 and a half inch blade. You're coming about 28 and a quarter is actually the length of this blade if you were to straighten it out. Now this one, the Tachi, let's say it's 27 and a half, okay? You add 1.250, which would be one and a quarter, because that's the curvature of this. Add that to the length of the blade. That's how long this sword is straight. Okay, that's how much a sword is going to shrink down. And not only does a sword actually shrink down lengthwise, but widthwise, because when metal's hot. It expands and it expands a lot depending on what you're doing with it but when it cools down it compresses and shrinks okay that's why when you get a sword made it doesn't matter what sword company you go with they will normally tell you they will have it in the parameters that you request because it's going to shrink it's going to shrink lengthwise and it's going to shrink somewhat widthwise. That's the nature of the beast. Okay. It can't. You're to get it a hundred percent accurate. You've basically had to have been doing this the majority of your life and know exactly down to the decimal how much material you need. And even then it won't a lot of times be a hundred percent accurate. It'll be fractions over okay some people may find that all oh, big deal whatever it's just the nature of the beast though so yeah your swords are actually longer than what they really are it's just they shrunk down because they put that curve to it so that's a something little nice little tidbit of information there so whatever your sorry is on your sword just add that to the length of your blade and that's how actually roughly it's not going to be 100 percent accurate but roughly how long that blade actually is so if you have a 30 inch blade three quarter you know sorry add that to it minus Plus or minus an eighth inch about that approximately. Give it a little fairness there. It's how long your blade is. So, to find the sori, very simple. Very, very, very simple way to find a sori on a sword like this. Any, actually, any sword. Um, you want to lay it down flat. Now, it's easy, you can take the handle off, it makes it very, very, very easy to do. You don't have to, but you want to lay it down either on something flat, or you can lay it down from the point to the hibaki, okay, because they can consider this part of the blade, okay, where the hibaki is. So you're going to 
put a straight line from here to here. Then you're going to measure from the very center point down. After that, that tells you exactly what the curvature of your blade is. No matter what blade it is that has a curve, that will tell you what you need. Or that will tell you the curve it, curvature of it. You can even do a mathematical equation where you want to figure out how much of a curve, how much material you need to put a curve in, and the equation will come out and be close to what this is. So, but we're not going to get into that. But those are the three, like I said, major sories for Japanese sories. I know it was a little bit disorganized in the beginning. Uh, my apologies. Is So, but like I said, we have a Kashizori, Sukizori, and Naka, Naga, Naka, Zori. Um, probably pronounced all those wrong. So, those are the, um, three, like I said, three basic Sori's for a Japanese sword. There's probably more. This is what I found. Now... Bohis are a lot, lot different. They actually, they do have names for all the bohis in different styles. Um, like double bohis. I think double bohis are really interesting. They really serve no other purpose. Um, it's not going to lighten the blade up anymore, actually, because they're not very deep. It's more um, for aesthetics. Looks this is basically what the sori is for. Or, excuse me, the bohi is for. So, this one right here is called a tom. Tomi. T O M E. Okay. Now, that one. stops before the hibaki okay so what this is used for is eido that's what tomi is used for is eido eido swords i've heard oh it makes the sword stronger well, I don't see how that can be, because it's just stopping before the hibaki. If you want a really strong blade, because bohi does take some integrity out of the blade, I wouldn't say a lot it takes out, because if it did, they probably wouldn't have done it, because the swords are breaking so easily. So... Yeah, I, I don't believe that one too much. But, if you want a strong blade, then just don't put a bohi in it. I don't see how this stopping before the hibaki is going to make it stronger. Except for at this point. It, that doesn't make no sense, but yet you have a bohi the rest of your blade. So if your blade breaks this right here and you have a nub, this doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. Now, I'm now taking the handles off of these because I have quite a bit of swords I have to go through on this. So, yeah. So, we have a shin Shinkin Bohi, and it extends to the Kasaki and Geometry Finish. So, Geometry Finish is it's not rounded on the end. It has more of a an angle to it. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, I don't think I have one of those. 
because like this one stops before the Kasaki. That one they're talking about extends past it. Okay, right into it, almost. So that's the type of bohi it is. It's a shinken. It goes just a little bit past to right about in here. So it goes past that Yukota line and goes right into here, the bohi. what it does and then we got the double bohi now the double bohi like I said from my found like this one has a geometric let me see if I can't get that in focus a geometric end okay now I didn't this is a custom job on my Otonto I did not ask them to do a geometry in, but they did it anyways, which was nice. I could have asked for it. Um, but yeah, that's the double bohi. Double bohi, it's just aesthetic look is all it is. It's not going to lessen the blade anymore from what I found out. And it's not going to take any more integrity out of the blade neither. So... If you want a double bohi because it looks cool, but you're afraid that it's going to take out too much integrity of the blade, it is not. You're perfectly fine. Okay. I just think they look neat. To be honest. That's why I had it done. Okay. So, and then this one... This one is a little different. I also don't have a sword like this. So, in the name, Ka King Naga, Nagashi, Ka King Nagashi, probably really slaughtering that, so I'm not even going to freaking try. Okay, so what it is is the Bohi actually goes halfway down the Nikago. Okay. This is another style that some swordsmiths Smiths did. Is it make the bohi go down to about approximately halfway the Nikago and then up to and stop before the Yakota line. It was just their style. There's no reasoning why they did it. It's just that's the way they did them. Okay. Bohis are being put into swords. 13th, 14th century, they're starting to do things like that. Um, some people I've read on forums said, oh, they did it because their blade was damaged, so they did it and put it in to take the damage out or whatever. There's not really anything to back that up. Um, I think they had it done because they figured out if they did it, made the sword a little bit lighter a little bit more controllable instead of this big heavy chunk of steel they had to wield if you're in battle because yeah um there is a bit of a difference in weight from this sword from the ones i have that don't have a bow you can feel the weight difference and if you're in battle and a battle can last, I don't know, 15 minutes, can last an hour. Depends on the battle. Depends on the duel. And, well, experience. How much experience somebody has. So, when you take that into account, how long you got to sit there and wield your sword, if you're using a sword, if you're in battle, or if you're in a duel, because you would be using a sword, you got to take all that into account. I don't think they did it because, oh, my sword's messed up. I'm just going to take it to a swordsmith and have him do it um, and put a bogey in it. That costed money. 
for them back then. And that means you're, you were without your sword until they were done with it. And then they had to temper the whole thing again. Because blades are already tempered. You put it in a fire, you just took all that tempering away. Now you have to re-temper it. I don't see them doing that. I don't see it as a, a, a feasible explanation for the bohi. I think it's just they were trying to lighten their weapon more. Now there's other ones such as now this one I did not get the name of. I wish I did. For the Unakubi. Now the Unakubi, you could say, is a double bohi. Which, in turn, is true. It is a double bohi, but in a different form of a double, for, uh, double bohi. And I thought I had written that one down. But I didn't. Which is shame on me for that. But, like I was saying, it is a form of double bohi, but in a different style. Because on Unikubi, the secondary bohi is pretty shallow and gets shallower and shallower as it gets to the end, kind of. Now, from what I understand, the bohi on a Naginata is actually a different name than this one. Okay. And it's similar, but there's a slight difference to, between the both of them. Where they got the idea for the bohi, for the, the Unikubi, was from the Naginata because they were chopping them down. And then eventually they were having swords made out of them. Um, based off the Naginata with the thinned out back. So, now does this thinned out back on the Unikubi weaken the blade? Uh, possibly could weaken it. It is a diamond though shape, if you actually feel it because it tapers on the back side. I would say it would be more prone to a bend first because that thinned out if it got hit hard enough from the side on a certain point. But yeah, the back side, if you were to smack it, it probably would break, yeah. But bohis. I mean, if some people say don't get them put in your sword, it takes the integrity out of it, it you know, you have more of a chance of your sword bending or breaking. I would say if you're using your sword that has a bohi and you're just cutting, let's say, to Tommy Matt's water bottles, um, real easy stuff, and it's bending or breaking, the temperament wasn't that good in your blade. And if your your sword's still breaking, and you're not just cutting those items, then you're potentially abusing the blade, okay? Because bamboo, now bamboo is a totally different beast. So yeah, because it's a very, very hard material. You want to make sure your edge alignment is kind of spot on for that. Second of all, you want to make sure it's 100% green you know, bamboo. If you cut dry bamboo, it will decimate your edge. Which comes to another thing when cutting bamboo. You cannot have an extremely keen edge on it. It will chip that edge out. You have to find that happy medium on your blade to cut bamboo. 
or it will bend it, it will break it, it will chip out. Okay? So, yeah. Have to be careful with bamboo. But do I think having a bohi is a bad idea and cutting bamboo? Absolutely not. If, like I said, your edge alignment is spot on or close to it, because we're not robots, you'll be perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Um, could you use a sword? Let's take this one, for instance, with a bohi in it in a battle, if you had to. Okay, because we really don't need to. Absolutely, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, it's not, you know, if you take a strike, it, your sword's going to be okay. Because if you're blocking, you're blocking down here, which is the thickest of the blade, not up here. This is just for parry, just to knock a blade out of the way. But take a hard hit, you're going to use the base. You'll be fine. So I know, like I said, I've read on forums, people asking questions like on Reddit, should I get a sword with a bohi, or should I get one without? And people say, oh, don't get one with the bohi, it takes too much integrity out. I think that's wrong. I don't think it takes that much integrity out of your blade. Otherwise, they would never have done it. And European swords would have never had done it. Swords break. That's the bottom line. When they're being used for what they were intended, which is battle, you know, for defense, and it doesn't matter if it's a Japanese sword, Chinese sword, Indian sword, or European sword, they broke, okay? And that's just due to, well, blocking and maybe hitting armor or shields, you name it. These broke. Plus, the quality of steel back then. It's not like it is today. It's way better today than it was back then. Okay, not saying that the quality of steel wasn't good. It was good for that time. Now it's way better. But, that's pretty much the bohi. Sorry and bohi. You know, it's a quick rundown for it. But, have fun with it. Measure your swords. You know, measure your sorry. Like I said, from the hibaki to, you know, lay it down from standing like this, from the tip of your blade to the hibaki, and then measure from here down, and that is your curve, you know? And if anybody wants me to do a video on it, how to do it hands-on, leave it in the comments, because I'm thinking about making a jig that will hold your sword so you can actually measure it accurately, you know, from this point down. And maybe I'll do a video on how to make one. Have one in my head, it's gonna be very, very simple to make. Just all out of wood. So, that's it. Let me know what you guys think at the bottom. And, uh, we'll see you later.